Well, that's a good way to start. Wake everybody up. Hola. Welcome to Barcelona. So we're going to take a somewhat tongue-in-cheek approach to relating our experiences with OpenStack and dealing with enterprise customers, as well as our own organization. Right. Um, my name is John Arway. I'm a senior technical staff member with IBM. I've primarily been working on our internal uh, CI system for the ZVM hypervisor. So it's a Nova plugin. We also have Neutron plugins coming along. And I have some mates here. Hi, I'm Emily Hugenbrook. As you probably guessed, I also work for the ZVM hypervisor for IBM. And I primarily work on the testing side of it. So you can ask me afterwards about testing RefStack, because I just went through getting our RefStack compliance for our appliance that we have uh, included in ZVM. Uh, so I'm active in the Tempest project, also active in Women of OpenStack with the speed mentoring, if any of you guys went to the speed mentoring breakfast. And this is my fifth summit, which is crazy to say. So, thanks. Uh, hello, my name is Ji Chen, and I'm mainly developing the uh, OpenStack Novak plugin for our ZVM driver. And also I uh, contribute to the OpenStack Novak project. So many in some review or commit. So thank you. All right, as you're going to see, we've broken down the presentation fundamentally into three parts. One is the more enterprisey stuff, right? The, the stuff that our clients and what we found interacting with them around OpenStack. The second is the organizational changes that it's driven on our own development team, right? Which is a substantively different issue. And the third is you know, a variation on the organizational piece is teaching our own developers how to play nice with the community. Because right? of course most of them came from a proprietary background. Big shock. So, into the minds of Moria we go. I did have to take a, a timeline here and I was really glad in the keynote yesterday to see Annie point out that you know, VMware has actually been around for a little bit longer than OpenStack's been around. And this just gives you kind of a, a sense for the timeline. All right, so if VMware has been a thing for, let's say, twice or three times as long as OpenStack, ZVM's been around a little bit longer, right, by a decade or two. So it shouldn't be a big surprise if you find out in the course of doing something like a plugin that the abstraction layers don't quite match and you have to do some creative papering over the differences. This is a very high level uh, architectural diagram of what we've got going on when it comes to running OpenStack on ZVM, right? And I took the architecture by analogy approach here. So this is, we've got a hypervisor at the bottom. It's actually in two pieces for historical reasons not to worry about. Pretend they say KVM, right? If you understand KVM, you'll get the right idea to first and even to second order. It's a thing that runs guests underneath it. There's some of these guests in particular are fundamentally systems management stack for the operating, for the hypervisor. That's the SMAPI and open cloud pieces. Um, good here, Pico? Okay. Um, the SMAPI layer is what you would think of conceptually as libvert. Right, it's an API that the OpenStack plugin pushes down onto. It's remotable. It manages guests through the, the hypervisor, that kind of thing. So it's not radically different than anything you've seen. It's just the names are spelled differently. Right? And that hides a certain layer of abstractional differences, but still to first order, the animals in the zoo are fundamentally the same. And the OpenStack piece is just like you know, anywhere else. The plugins are written in Python, so you can run them on this hypervisor, you can run them on x86 if you like, wherever you, you choose to. And we've got different products running in each of those situations, in fact, right now. So one of the first problems we had was our own clients are being told by their CIOs, you guys got to go do the cloud, right? You mainframe guys, go do the cloud. And sometimes the CIO kind of knows what that means and just as often not really let alone is their definition of the cloud the same as the OpenStack definition of the cloud, right? That's obviously been a topic of some discussion 
on its own recently. What is the OpenStack definition of a cloud? So one of the first things we ran into was you know, our own technical leaders in some cases, sales people and other, telling these organizations that have, remember, some of them have been doing virtualization since the 70s, right? So we're talking 30, 40 years. They've got a whole bunch of homegrown processes built around managing these cat, pets or cattle, whatever you want to call them. And you, know, you get people walking in and saying, sure, you can do cloud and you don't have to change any of that other stuff. Don't worry about it, right? It's, if you know OpenStack as you people do, you know that's not really true, right? OpenStack has its ideas, you know, this is my playground and everybody else kind of get off. So you have to be careful about that, and there's various ways you can deal with it. As with a lot of these things, the biggest issue usually is understanding you need to ask the question and probe them a little bit and see what they mean. If they come to you and say, well, we need to do cloud, what does that mean to them? Right? We've had some of them come to us, and when we probe a little, what we get is we want to manage things exactly the way we're doing it today, which means we have our own custom scripts, we want to use those to create our guests, to manage the, the CPUs and the storage on them, but we want a self-service portal in front of it for our developers to use, right? You don't need OpenStack for that. If you're willing to give up some of those scripts that you know and love so well, you can use OpenStack, right? But it's not a zero change kind of a, an adoption. The second thing we have is sort of a, a larger variation on that same team to, to some degree, right? We've had clients come to us and say, okay, we've been told to do OpenStack and the CIO, I'm sorry, we've been told to do cloud and the CIO says we absolutely must use the OpenStack APIs to do it because our organizational orchestration standard product is thus and such and it talks OpenStack, right? Okay, so, you know, good, well-meaning people not probing any further, it's always a debatable thing in 2020 hindsight, say, ah, okay, you must do OpenStack. We have things that do OpenStack. You wanna run them on the mainframe? We have things that let you run on the mainframe. Match made in heaven, right? What the questions they didn't know they needed to ask at that point was, are you willing to give up those custom scripts and things that you've used to build and manage these guests for years that are hooked into your backup systems, that are hooked into your compliance systems, that are hooked into your license management systems? Well, and the answer, of course, was no, we don't want to give those things up. So there was a little bit of an organizational debate to go on, right? You have to figure out how in this world do you do compliance? You don't have to do it through OpenStack, right? But you have to be careful to articulate when something is possible to do and manage through OpenStack and when it has to be done from the outside, right? The, you can't expect the kinds of enterprise clients you're gonna get, especially when you're coming from executives or, or managers of IT infrastructure groups, to understand all the technical details of, of OpenStack that people in this room just understand, right? Because you've sort of assimilated over time. They don't have that technical background and you need to help them figure out what the boundaries are because they still care about running their businesses. Right? Their compliance issues don't go away. Their license issues don't go away. They have to figure out how to make it work together. So you have to have some idea when you're walking in at least of which of those questions you know how to answer and which of those you have to say, well, we need to sit down and figure that out right? and do an architecture that works for your enterprise. Because of course they all have different products they want to use. Sometimes they have homegrown kit, all kinds of things. Right? You, you see the gamut if you talk to even a few customers. Third, third or fourth thing we've run into is the assumption that public and private have the same needs. And another way to, to think about this is, are you trying to be a service provider or are you just trying to, to sort of run your own DevOps stuff in the cloud? because right, they have very different business models. And that forces different effects on you. You care about different metrics. Okay, when we did the Linux One Community Cloud as an example, which is a, you know, a cloud running on ZVM, the first thing those people wanted to know was, 
how many instances can I deploy in parallel in 10 minutes? Right, which is not something that in 25 years people had really cared much about on ZVM because it was always the systems administrators doing it, it wasn't end users. Right? And the system administrators weren't going to conferences and on every chair in a keynote putting a little flyer that says, hey, go try out this cloud. Right? And expecting a spike to come in in the next hour. So you get very different usage models that come out of that and you have to have different metrics sometimes for your own development group, right? We'll find, and Emily will touch on this again before, or later, you know, this is gonna stress different parts of the stack potentially. With something like ZVM where that management stack had primarily been operated by humans, in some cases by scripts, but still the scripts were directly being run by humans. It wasn't quite as automated as we're doing. New problems are gonna fall out of that. Right? Whether the problems in the homegrown stuff or problems in the base, it, it doesn't matter in the end. Somebody's got to go figure it out and deal with it. One of my favorites being somewhat of a security you know, weenie on the side was we went to one of our first major customers who's a large U.S. company. They do a substantial number of all the paychecks in the U.S., as an example. Like every month they print paychecks. They do healthcare signups as an outsourcing sort of business, right? Very large company, a lot of running on the mainframe. We walked in and we happened to be, at, just from a timing standpoint, we're dealing with Juno. So we, we got Juno in there and they said, okay, we want to hook this up to our enterprise LDAP system. And that's when we discovered, that, oh, there are some fixes that we need from Kilo backported, right? Because otherwise the queries don't work. So you run into things like this. So you, obviously that specific example is fixed now, but the lesson is you have to understand how you're gonna fit into these things they care about because they were actually fairly sophisticated, right? They knew they were gonna have multiple clouds internally more because they're a service provider and they have certain you know, different compliance regimes they have to deal with. And they wanted to allow the humans, you know, their own employees to work off the enterprise LDAP but the service IDs like the Nova and the Neutron and you know, your, your friends to have different credentials in each cloud. So that if one cloud gets hacked, it's not all of them, right? Very sensible security. That's the model they have in their head. We couldn't deal with that out of the box because of the Juno Kilo backporting of fixes sort of issue. Another thing that can go wrong and certainly have to probe for is why are they doing this? Right? What, do they, what do they really need out of it? One of the, the criteria that you know, kind of blindsided some people in the development organization was they came in and said, all right, we've been working on this for two months and it's just about there, you know, we're ready to demo it to the executives. Oh my God, this other group inside did a, you know, a demo with another cloud provider and they can provision, I don't know what it was, 20 in 10 minutes or something. You have to be able to do that, right, by this week. Like, the moral is you have to understand what your, you know, your competition is even within the company and what other groups are engaging because you know, it's like any other change, right? Change is hard, people resist change naturally, right? it's cognitively loaded. So if you can provide it to the, something to them in a way that makes their lives easier, your conversations are gonna be so much better. And it's not just you know, you as an OpenStack distro provider with the IT people running it, the operators, it's the end users. And if you can keep the end users happy, the operators are happy, their managers are happy, they'll buy your stuff, oddly enough. So you have to, you know, keep in mind that second level effect and not get, um, you know, wrapped up in the first level and just making the operators happy. It's also the people the operators are dealing with. Another thing you can do is make it as complex as possible, right? We, um, we made some mistakes in our first pass. We had some ideas about, oh, let's make this perfectly encapsulated appliance. Thou shalt not have root access for lots of good reasons. And then of course, as soon as you find things wrong, like, oh, this file isn't getting your log rotated and therefore after a month of uptime, it fills the file system and you have to go in and do odd things. 
right? and you can't do them because you're not able to sudo on this particular command. Right? You can't edit this file through sudo. Obviously, you have to fix those over time. But the point is, you may actually need to be able to break that encapsulation sometimes. And you should be prepared for that. You know, one of the first things I did after joining this group kind of midstream was force that issue of, no, we need to be able to sudo as root, even if it's just for service purposes. We don't have to document it. We have to tell them about it, you know, in advance. But we need a way to tell someone, yes, we've diagnosed what's wrong. Here's what you go do as a command, and it will fix it until we can get you a proper uh, service fix. Another bugaboo is the upgrade pace. Right? Enterprises, because they have to deal with these auxiliary processes, the license management, the backups, the disaster recovery, the compliance. Right? In, the, in the US, there's healthcare rules. In Europe here, there's uh, locale, you know, rules about where your data lives. Right? All these things matter, more or less, depending on which government you have to be dealing with at the time or which industry. Well, if, you, if it takes them three or four months to get through their internal certification process to make an, you know, a new VM basically go online, which is not uncommon in the enterprise space, and you tell them every six months you're going to do a complete upgrade of you know, like the whole thing, they kind of toss a hairball on that right, very often. And it depends on the, their own maturity level, right? This is another, it gets into the organizational aspects as well. If they as an organization are also trying to do a lot more of the agile and the DevOps kinds of things, they may be more willing to accept frequent upgrades. Right? But if they're gated by processes that are outside their control, like some of these compliance and certification tests, that's not you know, only gonna matter so much. In the end, you're gonna be gated by what they can successfully adopt and put into production because they've got the same problems we all do, right? They have to keep their bosses happy. The bosses have to keep the shareholders happy. They have to keep their clients that are paying the bills happy, right? This all, will, all rolls downhill, none of it's in isolation. So the upgrade pace and, and how smooth each one of those upgrades goes can make or break what you're doing. We happen to skip releases. We take the, we're gonna do it once a year because for our customer set, that seems to be the sweet spot, right? We know there are some holdouts that'll go all the way out to 18 months. Okay, they're more risk averse than the others. That's allowed. But we at least give them a, you know, a range of choice and we try to be upfront about this is your range of choice because it's more frequent than they're used to with other, some of these other products. Right, some of the other components in these systems, they only get a new version every four or five years. Right, they'll, they'll get smaller bits of function in between there, but they won't get something called a new version with the whole upgrade path and scenario more, than, you know, more often than every couple of years. So you know, I think you've gotten the message at this point, right? You can deal with these things. Right? None of this is insoluble. It shouldn't cause you to go, you know, running scary into the bay and go, ah. that's not the answer. The answer is to think about some of it before you walk in there. So you're not that deer in the headlights. You say, okay, what are your issues here? Right? Do you have to deal with compliance? What are your processes today? So you can help assess which ones OpenStack is gonna fit into and which ones it's gonna fit less well with. So with that, Ms. Emily is going to talk to us about organizational issues. Cool. Thanks, John. So starting to talk about organizational issues, I want to tell you a little bit about our team to begin with. So our team is split between the U.S. and China. Our U.S. team uh, comes from the ZBM hypervisor, so people who have worked on very proprietary technology, lots of emphasis on IP, on keeping things secret, on maybe a model of software development that would be the opposite of Agile. Wonderful. Uh, so working with, with that team had its challenges. Uh, working then with the, the China team was completely a new team for this project. So uh, bringing them into the, the ZBM org and getting them trained into our organization, as well as working on OpenStack and our drivers. 
So first big mistake we made, um, I'm sure probably a lot of us have made this mistake at some point, um, getting your own private copy of an open source code and making lots and lots of changes and only periodically pushing it back out, right? Because it's not perfect yet. It's kind of a lot of work to push it back out there. We started that um, probably with the, the China team. They were having some issues getting through the firewall to GitHub. And of course, our US team was totally used to working with private repositories. So they said, yeah, of course, we'll make a private copy of our working code. And then like every six months, we'll push it back out to GitHub. You guys can laugh at that. It was a really bad idea. So uh, we have fixed that now, obviously, um, but not after a lot of pain um, and a lot of going through and then you wind up with a whole bunch of conflicts as you're trying to merge it in and um, I don't recommend that. Going half in on open source. So John showed you the picture of our, our stack and we have our open stack drivers uh, that talk to XCAT, which is the Extreme Cloud Administration Toolkit. So that's another open source project um, that we support in ZBM. And again, with XCAT, we had come from a place of the XCAT community is a lot smaller than the OpenStack community. It was perfectly fine with XCAT. It didn't change that often, so we were okay with doing this private copy of our driver and pushing it back up every once in a while. And so even when we started developing our OpenStack drivers in the open and you know, doing the, all of our commits directly to the, to the GitHub, rather than to our own private drivers, we were still doing that with the XCAT drivers. So now we have two different build processes. And so when you're trying to put things together, it's just a nightmare because you remember, oh, things go this way and part of it, and this way and part of it, and better just to do everything out in the open, bite the bullet, make the change. So lesson learned there too. John touched on this. Uh, we have a lot of existing components in our stack, and we had been using them in certain ways for many years in some cases. And then all of a sudden, we were using them in totally new ways. OpenStack was maybe pushing down on things a lot more often uh, than previous solutions had been. And we found new stress points um, very quickly, uh, especially with that Linux One Community Cloud. And yeah, it was a, a real shock to us. And so we had to put a lot of new test environments in and it taught us a lot about how to test our stack better, about the, the different stress points that we need to look at and how to really look at things differently there. This is probably the, the biggest one, ignoring the organizational and cultural change. So not sitting down with the team before we started this and going through, okay, well, when you want to develop something, you're going to put a blueprint out in the open. Uh, when you want to work on something, it's okay to put small changes out there even if they don't have the whole function. Uh, you know, people were used to this environment where it's a lot of intellectual property, um, and so they're like, well, I don't want to tell too many people about my design because it might get stolen. It's open source, of course it's gonna get stolen. That's the point of it. Uh, you put it out there to be stolen, right? And so not just addressing that change up front, uh, not addressing the, the difference to management of how this team would need to be managed differently than the traditional team. So our manager has the open source team under him. He also has a, a traditional development team under him. And so we're competing with them for resources in a nice way, because we all work for the same department. But when it comes to things like sending us to OpenStack summits, the question I get all the time is, which customers are you going to meet with? Because the budget for OpenStack summit travel comes out of the same bucket as the budget for customer travel. I'm like, well, that's not the point of the OpenStack summit. They say, well, you can't go to mid-cycles. There won't be any customers there. Well, it's not the point of a mid-cycle. Um, and so not addressing this with management right up front that, you know, these things need to come from different buckets. It's, it's a new way of developing, and we need to accept that there are new ways then of collaborating and designing. And we need to do lots of education with the, the team to... And we need to do lots of education with the team to, to make sure that they understand that.
in case you can't tell, I'm the one who put the rainbow in the presentation. <laughs> so how did we solve these issues? Well, it, it was a lot of scraped knees and, and pain, um, but we are working through it. We're learning to do a lot more education with the team. One thing we did uh, was appoint kind of community liaisons, both for our US team and our China team. So people who were working mostly facing in the community so that they could come back and then educate their team members uh, about how to work better in the community. Uh, with management, we actually started meetings with our manager, with managers of other groups that were wholly open source, um, and, and that has helped some. Um, one thing that just came up the other week is uh, my manager was saying to me, oh, I'm not sure this, this CI system that we have. Would that have caught some of the problems in the, in the public cloud before they caught it? You know, if we had had the CI system up and running two years ago? I said, yeah, yeah, it definitely would. It would have driven that, you know, level of load on the system and, and we would have found these different stress points. And he said, oh, I didn't realize that the CI system had that benefit. You know, the CI system is not just, just a little change by change test system, that it can also drive these big stressful tests and things like that. So doing this kind of education about why the open source community does things the way it, it does, why these things are important, and talking with our, our team about why it's important. We're also, having, we're also now reaching out with our business partners. Uh, so we work with SUSE, who includes our, our plugins in their SUSE Open Cloud project, Open Cloud product. Tongue twister there. And so we're working with, with SUSE, and they're looking at our drivers and talking to us about our drivers. But there are other business partners that maybe are not as familiar with working in the open source community. So we're starting to reach out to them. Uh, we're starting to work with the Open Mainframe Project, which is an out, outreach of the Linux Foundation. So we're starting a cloud stack consortium with the Open Mainframe Project. And so we're hoping there to bring in some of our clients to talk about some of the things like John talked about, and also to bring in some of our business partners to talk about how they can develop more in the open too, and how we can work together to develop our plugins in the open. So with that lead into working with the community, I'm going to turn it over to Ji Chen. I take this. Uh, uh, first of all, I hate my CI because sometimes it gives me some trouble to let me fix the problems. I, someone tell me, you need to fix this. It's a blocker. You need to fix this. But yeah, so it's, but CI is very important for us to, to development. So, uh, Back to, as Emily said, back to 2013 or 2012, we are start to work with community. And at that time, we saw that we are very uh, experienced people. We are new hiring IBM, but we have a lot of experience in other companies. So we saw that we are expert. We are, we are, we are, you need, you guys, or community guys, you guys need to listen to our suggestions or otherwise. But uh, it's not true because uh, we are working not for open source per decade. We are not very familiar with open, open source culture. And there are some, for example, some concept gaps between, between our solutions and OpenStack. For example, Nova Resize. Uh, Nova Resize is kind of, uh, you, can, you can resize the instance and you can log on to the instance and see whether it satisfies you or you don't want it, you can revert. So this is totally different to our ZVM concept. We just resized this instance and nothing else. So from uh, cooperation with the uh, community, we learned that we need to uh, be familiar with community first. So you need to listen to community suggestion or concept first. And after that, you can uh, bring your suggestions to the pain points or to the stuff that you, you think you need to change. So this is what we learned. And this is, a, as you know, we, we are a pretty small team. We don't have that resource as a, as a big, uh, bigger team. So all of us not only need to develop our stuffs, but also need to contribute to the community. So this brings a question. 
So when you arrived at office at nine o'clock with a very happy mode, and suddenly you found open your open your computer, you want to subscribe the mail of community and see what happened there, but you got a, got a phone call from your field team, and they said our customer has a problem or they want some this, this, and this. So what you do? You need to think about which one is bad, which one is have more priority to you. Either cooperate with your customer or work with community. So we have this kind of problem because limited resource, we need to focus on the customer case first. And when you solve customer problem, you will find, oh, I, I don't have time. I, I need to play with my son. I, I need to teach my son mathematics or whatever. So you don't have time or don't have enough time to work with community. That's, uh, that's been a problem to us. But we need to find to, to know how to solve this problem. So back to 2013, we start to th think about that not our, all our team members need to contribute to the community. Maybe part of them need to involve. And I, for example, we got some mentors in, in same time zone. That's, that's very important because as, as Emily said, a lot of uh, our team members are in US. And f for example, a lot of uh, core contributors of uh, OpenStack are also in the US. So it's two hour difference. You cannot catch any people in your normal time, time, normal work time. So what we have done is we reached some core people in Australia or some other place near our Asia Pacific. So we try to reach them and set some phone call. You, as you know, phone call is much easier than same time or, or some uh, in, uh, put text in a, in a screen. So that's much easier for us. And also, we are trying to use some, uh, let's say, weekly weekly share or monthly share, so all the people in a in a team can know what's going on there. And so you don't you don't need to be f fully involved, but part of the team will share the information. And if you have real interest, then you can continue to work on that. And so. <coughs> One problem of us is we are not x86 system. So our, our reported bugs sometimes are not considered as a, you need to reproduce this in x86 because you are not working for a, for, a, for, a, for a DB stack. So you need to show the logs and you need to show the proof. But we try to manage that and we uh, give some help of, of the community. So we solve up some bugs and yeah, so this is uh, what we have done in a, in a period of five or four years, and we have learned something, as June and Emily said, through the, uh, the process of uh, our enterprise support. So that's all, and do you have any uh, open for questions? Oh, come on, someone must be wondering something. Yeah. Are you guys all, anybody else dealing with the switch from proprietary to open source in their organizations? No, you all got hired right out of college into, into open source? Not old like me. Um, I'm a journalist, so my job is to try and understand this stuff and write about it, so not smart as you guys at all. But I'd like to hear a little bit more about the, the cultural problems and how you tackled them, if you could go into a bit more detail on that. Good. No, he's just trying to get us on stage. Oh. It's on the video. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I, I think that one thing that I've had to, to say to the team multiple times is, you know, it's okay to admit our mistakes in the open. It's okay to, you know, let people see the process. Um, and so the feeling sometimes with the, the team like, oh, well, we don't want a bug opened out in Launchpad. We'd rather have an internal repository for bugs so that people don't have to, to see the mistakes we've made. Um, obviously, with this presentation, we're, we're working toward being very much more open about the mistakes we've made because that's, that's not a bad thing in open source, right? We work through our mistakes. We learn through our mistakes. Um, 
and getting the, the design doc out in the open, um, too, I think has, has been a big, a big thing. I don't know how many times I have to, to say to people, like, it's really okay to put it out there, uh, put it in a wiki, <laughs> put it somewhere where people can see, um, give all of the, the doc behind it. it. You know, if somebody else takes it and downloads it on their own machine and puts it into a proprietary product, that's going to cause them legal issues. Like, people are still very much in the, the mode of like, oh no, they're going to steal our IP and put it into their product. And the, just getting people to understand that's not a concern at all. So uh, there must be considerable internal resistance inside IBM, given what happened with Oracle and OpenSolaris and so on. Uh, and there are other examples, but that would be very clear in everyone's minds in the senior management of, of IBM. So c could you maybe discuss how you tackled that, that one? I don't know that we tackled it so much. I think it's really been a sea change in the industry. Because I mean, certainly when I started, Yes, there were examples, there were you know, long-running multi-year things, we were, had things drilled into our heads. But really it's come from the top. I mean, we have you know, an internal GitHub enterprise now, for example, is one of the things that's, that's come up in the last couple of years. And the different units, it varies by which part of IBM, you know, I mean, it's the same thing that happens in a large enough company. I, mean, I don't think it's a, that's a shock. But it really is coming from the highest levels of you know, get out there and be open. I personally maybe was inoculated a little bit earlier because about 10 years ago I changed over to the, what was the Tivoli unit and did a whole bunch of standards work. All right, so I was in the W3C, I was in DMTF, places like that, where, all right, mo a lot of it wasn't open source, it was more about specifications. But aside from that, you know, the deliverables are, are all open, you're doing everything in the open. I mean, I was a W3C work group chair for about four years. Right? The process is really drilled into you. Um, where you have to work on, I think, our own management a little bit was actually the middle and lower layers. Right? Because that hadn't percolated all the way down into the systems unit yet. It was up at the top, and certainly the cloud people understood it, and the, you know, the IoT people understood it. Because those are much more, you know, we're part of this ecosystem, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff we've got to fit into, sort of mindset which is not where the hardware division typically came from historically. Right? But those people are at least educable. Right? They are people that you can work with and you can say, you know, here are the business reasons for doing this. You know, by the way, you're hearing this from our senior VP and whatever. This is actually what it means. This is an example. And they can respond to that over time. You know, it's, it's no different from other humans. Some are faster than others, some are more resistant than others, but in the end, they get it. And I think we got some, some support within the, the ZVM organization, too, um, because they actually went through a fight back in the 80s about whether or not to release all of their, their code out in the open. It wasn't quite the same as open source then. Um, so there are still some older developers who uh, might still have badges and pins from from that fight who feel badly that there were, <laughs> that things uh, went uh, more proprietary, you know, 30 years ago. So you, you, this isn't a discussion about training and skills, but you, you kind of went there. So uh, do you have any guidance for the people in the room of uh, people who, as you say, are educatable, like smart people, but they, they need to change their ways of working to be more collaborative and, and uh, using the modern, not waterfall anymore, process. So do you have any advice for self-paced learning, uh, boot camp? What, what is the best approach? I'm a big opportunist, right? So I like, I just sort of talk to people and find out who's the most receptive. Find one or two or three of them. <laughs> Careful, that thing's loaded. I <laughs> one or two or three of them, you know, give them a bite-sized project they can work on and really encourage them to try the new stuff, try the different tool, you know, whether it's Slack or GitHub or whatever. Let them show that it's possible because a whole lot of the doubters start from the, oh, that'll never work mindset, right? 
and you put a big pin in that balloon, the instant you say, well, these guys did it, and they're the junior developers in the group, what's the problem? Right? Explain it to me. Really changes the conversation. Um, and, you know, I mean, some people, even if they're in the resistant patch at the, at the beginning, they're self-reflective enough that when they see that success, they'll start to say, well, all right, maybe I do need to learn something new here. You know, there's always going to be the trailing edge. We all know the Clayton Christensen adoption curve. There's always the stragglers. Accept that. You won't win every battle. Back. Another question? Yeah, just lob the mic. Speak and catch. <laughs> Um, are there any particular pain points or friction points, perhaps, um, with the community that you can talk about that you had to work through and how you did that? How you, how you helped change their minds, perhaps, in order to, to, to um, help, them, help them accept the kinds of changes that, that you wanted to make in, in, the, 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 in OpenStack? Um. I think you're on. Yeah. I'm not? I think no. you can. So, so recently we are trying to make our drivers for NOAA, for Newton and others to be accepted by the community. But uh, we got some trouble there because we will request not only for CI, but also for diversity. Because you are not only, you, you, we, because we are IBMer, we offer for Z system and we need to attract more people to work for the driver in order to grow and to convince the community that we have diversity, we have health, we are healthy because if our IBM is not going to play the game, then the whole project or the whole driver is gone. So the community don't want to see that. So we are trying to convince the community to, to accept our driver, but on, on the same time, we are trying to uh, fulfill the requirements of the community, such as we need to uh, run ten, uh, to uh, under the SRA of our CI system in four hours to submit a vote for the, for the patches. And we need to uh, uh, attract more people to work for, work for that. Such kind of uh, thing will be the uh, top challenge or top risk for us in the a, in a, in a short term or mid term. I'll just put in another plug for the open mainframe project because uh, the, the Linux Foundation having, you know, talking to the Linux Foundation about, you know, what we can do and also about how we can talk better with the, the community um, and how we can bring more of our business partners in to help us talk with the community so, again, our drivers don't look so much like they're just IBM working on them. So that we're out of time. If people want to... Um, ask us more questions, we'll just go out in the hall, I think, after the session, so that way the people can get in for the next presentation. Okay, thanks everyone. We are signing autographs. <laughs> <laughs>